Good morning. Um, my name is Lee haber -Cuck, and I'm a member of the Hamilton class of 1987. I'm pleased to welcome um, those of you who are here with us in person as well as those of you joining us on Facebook for a very timely discussion. Um, the idea for our, this session stems from the new Common Ground program at Hamilton, which President Whitman uh, describes as a respectful dialogue across political boundaries. Um, and that leads us to the topic of our session, just how wide is the partisan divide? And we're about to find out from two highly regarded Washington insiders who are also Hamilton alumni. Um, I will let our moderator present our speakers, but let me introduce uh, you to her now. Uh, Jackie Judd is herself a Washington veteran, having covered the um, Clinton impeachment as well as breaking the story of uh, Monica Lewinsky's blue dress. Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, she has been a journalist most of her life. In addition to um, uh, covering politics, she's covered health care policy, the Supreme Court, and international events such as Tiananmen Square. Uh, she spent many years with ABC News in Washington, D.C., where she reported for World News Tonight, Nightline, and Good Morning America. Um, for the past few years, she's been a special correspondent for PBS NewsHour covering social issues. And she, in between there, she spent a decade at the Kaiser Family Foundation, um, which produces gold standard research on healthcare policy. Jackie is also a member of the Hamilton family. She is the mother of twins, one of whom, Philip Schulman, graduated from Hamilton in 2014 and is now a campaign warrior for Democratic candidates. So we are grateful to have such an accomplished journalist to moderate our panel this morning, and we thank Jackie for being with us this morning. Um, so please join me in welcoming Jackie Judd. Thank you, Lee. I appreciate it, and I, I always say that on my tombstone will be written, here lies the blue dress lady. <laughs> so here I am. Uh, but thank you very much for the invitation to join this conversation. I think that no matter where you are on the political spectrum, we can all agree that we are living in pretty extraordinary times, that political polarization has never been worse in modern days, it certainly happened in our country before. You may recall the Civil War, but in modern times, I would say it's never been worse. We're going to spend the next hour or so with lots of questions from you, so begin thinking about that with two distinguished graduates about how we got here, what's the fallout, and how do we move the country back to some sense of balance and common ground. I'm going to introduce our distinguished graduates in a moment, but just let me share something with you. When I got the invitation to moderate this conversation a couple of months ago, I uh, started collecting quotes from newspapers, Twitter feeds, et cetera, about polarization. So let me just read a couple to you to give you a flavor of what we're all going to be talking about in this world that we find ourselves living in at the moment. There was a Pew study, which I think most of you know about, uh, documenting political polarization. And a writer in the Washington Post argued that, that the polarization is about the parties sorting themselves out. That the middle, the middle of the electorate still exists, but it's the parties sorting themselves out. And he wrote, if you are a conservative or a liberal, there used to be people like you in the opposing party. So the other party wasn't all that bad. Now it is all bad. I'm going to quote Norman Lear, of all people, who some of you may remember produced the groundbreaking show All in the Family. He was profiled in the Washington Post, and he said he isn't surprised that a sense of outrage and disillusionment has taken over, an Archie Bunker mentality fused with a meathead stridency, everyone digitally shouting over each other into oblivion. Fareed Zakaria, a commentator and writer, wrote, politics is about tribal affiliation now. It is not about the issues. The problem with this is it has to be winner take all. There cannot be compromise. And finally, from Mike Allen, who now writes for Axios, he was describing uh, in kind of a bullet point format this kind of death grip we seem to be engaged in. And he wrote, 
The cable beast awakens, the fringes ferment, opinions fly, we go to bed, sleep poorly, wake up, and do it all over again. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so to my immediate right. I slept well last night. <laughs> Mark, I always sleep well. <laughs> Mike Dubke is a member of the class of 92. He was the White House Communications Director this year for several months. He founded Crossroads Media. He co-founded the PR firm BlackRock Group. Mark Elias is in the class of 90. He was the general counsel for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, served in that same role for John Kerry in 2004 was the lead counsel in the recount uh, for Senator Al Franken and heads the political law practice at Perkins Coy. Thank you both so much for being here. We really appreciate it. So I began saying I want to first talk about how did we get here. I think in this polarized environment, it may be easy to believe that this just happened in the past year or two. But in fact, the roots are deeper and longer than that gerrymandering, money in politics, animus towards Obama. You could pick any number of things. So share with me your thoughts about what, what were the inflection points in the past couple of decades? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with a, a, couple, a couple of dates, or at least one date where I think we had an inflection point that got us, at least from a technology standpoint, to where we are today. And I look back at, uh, from a policy and technology standpoint, I look back at uh, 2004, our re-election campaign for George W. Bush. Um, John Kerry was, uh, was the, the challenger that year. And the Republican Party, and I'll speak to the Republicans and you can talk about the, the Democrats, but the Republican Party made a strategic decision. And that strategic decision was to go after the base uh, and turn the base out and get those individuals who more identified with republicanism or conservative ideas to turn out and vote in an election year um, rather than trying to persuade the middle. And they did that for a couple of reasons. They did that because of technology. We had uh, developed a, um, an, a firm that uh, actually sublets space for me now ca called Target Point Consulting. Um, they were the, uh, the start of micro-targeting. So we were able to slice and dice the electorate into these very, um, very narrow uh, divisions, but then we could target those divisions with, at that time, mail and, and phone calls to turn, get people interested, either be, get them excited or get them pissed off, and get them to turn out. So that happened at the same time that we had campaign finance reform, and you can talk a little bit about this from the legal standpoint, but in 2004, or, uh, 2004 is when we had BICRA. And what BICRA was, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2004, many of you know it as McCain-Feingold, but it basically took money out of the political parties and allowed that money and actually gave license for that money to uh, be spent uh, rather than political parties who had this broad base uh, to very narrow interests that either had the interests of the candidate in mind or a very narrow social um, or fiscal or, or some type of public policy issue. The money was concentrated on single issue independent expenditure organizations. Um, they advertised at the same time that at least one of the political parties decided that it was much more efficient uh, to turn out those who might be like you than it was uh, to spend money to try to persuade somebody. So we had that all happening at the same time. The technology also allowed us to create districts uh, where you had majority Republican, majority Democrat, and the fights were not in the general election anymore. The fights were in the primaries. So it, all of these layers, I think, over the years, from 2000 to 2004 to 2008, uh, just created an atmosphere where it was easier and more efficient and frankly uh, gave you a clearer path to victory for both of the political parties to hyper focus on those 40 percent of the people uh, that, that you could get turned out and motivated uh, to come out for an election and vote for your person. And so the middle didn't matter anymore? Middle doesn't, middle, middle, no. I'll just end it there. 
That's why we're here today. <laughs> <laughs> the middle doesn't matter anymore. So I'll pick up on the middle doesn't matter anymore, and then I'll come back to uh, some other additional in, uh, inflection points. Um, I used to do this during the 2016, lead up to the 2016 campaign, and it, I realized really irritated people. So I stopped doing it, but I would see someone, or I'd strike a conversation with someone, and inevitably they would describe themselves as a moderate or an independent. And I would say, no, 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 you're not actually an independent. Let me just ask you a few questions, okay? You're great at cocktail parties. What is, <laughs> you know, if I didn't know, I would ask, you know, what is your racial background? Then I would know their gender. I'd ask their marital status. I'd ask their highest educational attainment. And uh, I'd ask where they lived. And then I'd say, okay, you're, you don't know that you're gonna vote for Hillary Clinton, but you're going to. <laughs> or you don't know that you're gonna vote for Donald Trump. You think you're in this like, you think you're undecided. You're not actually undecided. You, 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 you may believe you are, but in the end of the day, you're, you're, you're not. And we, we've seen this for years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we do polling, we'll poll, and I'll just take a really simple example. You know, you take an election a year out, and you, you poll people and you say, do you support Smith the Democrat or Jones the Republican? About, you know, 70% of African Americans will say they support Smith. About 20% will say they support, um, about 10 percent say they support Jones, 20 percent said they're undecided. Now he will tell you they're not actually they're, they, they are undecided in the sense that they haven't yet decided right but but the, but, but, the, but the election's not going to wind up 70 30 okay looking at it just on a demographic level and, and, and that's true for every one of you too like you think that that you're not some, a lot of you are not in your thinking, oh yeah, that's true for African American but no no it's true for you and you and you and you. So all of you sit there thinking, oh no, I just judge the candidate. And every election I just kind of like sit back and I think, huh. And I read you know, the issue. And I read the issues and I yeah. kind of study up on them and decide do I really like them more than the other person and I agonize over this. It's actually not true. Or it may be true you're doing that, but where you're gonna wind up, there aren't that many truly independents. There are a lot of people who describe themselves as independent. But, you know, for example, in 2016, most of the people who described themselves as independent in the Democratic primary were, were Sanders supporters. These were not moderates. I mean, these were not people who were choosing between the Democrat and Republican, right? They're, they're sort of unaffiliated Democratic voters. And then they're- Who don't vote. Right, they, right, but they may not vote at all, but if they right. vote, they're not, they're, not, right. they're, not, they're not struggling between the Democrats and the Republicans. And likewise, on the Republican side, you have, you have folks who, who are, struggling between in Alabama right now. You know, you get a lot of, you get a big undecided vote um, among people who, when you profile them out, they, they, they are just, they are conservative Republicans. Like, they're not, unde they're not, they're not actually struggling right. much between voting for the Democrat or the Republican. They're kind of like, do I vote for the child predator or no one? Because they're the same. And then they come back to, in the end, all right, the child predator is not that bad. It's 40 years ago. <clears throat> you know, who knows, right? Um, and, and, that's, and that's what you see at the end of elections. All I can think about, who hasn't hung out at a piercing pagoda? Right. At the mall. I mean, you know. It's a bad joke, I'm sorry. Who among you have not been banned from a mall? Come on. <laughs> right? Right? I mean, come on. <laughs> Um, but, but that's, but so, so I think that that's entirely right. Now, let me give you two other inflection points that, that will sort of hopefully get to the underlying question. Number one, um, 1994. Mm -hmm. So in 1994, Newt Gingrich did something which, um, was both awful and admirable. Um, it was awful for democracy and it was admirable as a, as an observer of politics, which is that he understood that going after, that the easiest way to win an election is to go after your opponent's ethics and your opponent's character. So, you know, people credit the contract with America for, or something. So it was 94, credit. right? 94. 94, I'm sorry. yeah. He's going 10 years before me. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, 94. Um, 
he, he understood that that, that that was going to be the easiest way to take control of the House. So remember, before the contract with America, he went after Speaker um, right. Wright, then he went after Speaker Foley in the House Bank, and he went after Tony Quello, who was in House Leadership. Like, he understood that the easiest way to win elections is to basically cast a pall over the other party as immoral or unethical. And we've seen that replicate itself now on, mm -hmm. on both sides. You could, you could in fact, I've, I've, I've argued elsewhere that you actually have never seen control of the House flip other than with that environment. Like that's in the last 20 years. In the last 20 years. I would totally agree with that. Yeah. So, so that's, that's meant that there is a much greater focus on beating each other, not on the issues, but beating each other on kind of disqualifying the other on, the, on, 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 um, uh, on ethics and on, on, on sort of personal character. Traits. And making everything absolutely black and white. Right. Right. No gray, right. no nuance. Well, and, and motivating the, I, I'd make the argument in Virginia, we just saw it, uh -huh. that uh, in, in Virginia, if you told Ed Gillespie, who lost and, and got swamped by Ralph Northam, who was not going to rock anyone's world as an orator, uh, if you told Ed Gillespie he was going to get as many votes as he did a year ago, he'd be measuring, he was yep. measuring curtains for the governor's mansion because he outperformed Trump in Virginia, he outperformed any Republican. Uh, that had ever run for governor of Virginia, and he got swamped. And the reason he got swamped wasn't because he didn't turn out the base. He turned out the base. He turned out more than the base. He got swamped because Northam and the Democrats turned out their base plus. And it was this momentum. It was this, and a lot of it had to do with, you know, national issues, not, not Virginia issues. And the, the Democrats were motivated. Uh, in 2017 in Virginia at, at the least. And, but we saw it in the suburbs of Philadelphia. They had elections, Montgomery County. Anyone that was a, a Democrat basically won. We, we just talked about Nassau County. I mean, I'd make the argument that across, and we were joking before, uh, Mark said, are you ready for the wave? And I, I just joked, I hope it crests in 17 <laughs> so we don't have the wave in 18 as a Republican. But uh, yeah, it was a wave, and that's these wave elections are are what uh, have changed the the House of Representatives, and and um, we'll see if and and it's a lot of it's based on character or what you infer about the character of the other party. Did you want to make one other point on? Yeah, that? the other <coughs> the other one, which is, which is um, more complicated and, in some ways, fraught for the long term health of the country is that we have seen, and, and obviously Trump has been at, the, um, at the, the forefront of this, but it existed before Trump. He just is acceler put accelerant to it. Is um, when, when, and I may have these numbers slightly wrong, so someone will correct me, but I believe in 1996, um, Bill Clinton, who was called by some the first black president, won 82% of the black vote, and did, by today's standards, remarkably well among whites. Like, we were still living in a, in a world in which race and ethnicity and gender mattered, but it was, not, it was not determinative. By the time you got to 2004, John Kerry got 87% of the black vote and got obliterated in places like Loudoun County, Virginia, or in the collar counties around uh, 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 Atlanta, or in Orange County, uh, or Suffolk County, New York. Okay, so you can you can kind of envision envision that. Um, by the time you get to 2016, you start to basically have you have. And, and by the way, George uh, George Bush did quite well among Hispanics in 2004. By the time we get to 2016, African Americans are 90 plus, 10, 90 plus Democratic. Hispanics are in the 70s, yeah. 80s. Asian Americans are yeah. are second only to African Americans. They're in the they're in the mid 80s, mm -hmm. and you start to see. Remember, in 2004, it was all about married. It was all about married white women. Remember, soccer moms, security yes. moms, right? Now it's just like basically, it's you take college educate, you take highest educational attainment. And that becomes a much more significant divide. I mean, gender is still quite quite significant, but 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 we have. 
I don't know that it's, part of it is reflective of how we target, for sure, but some of it is reflective of it has become okay in 2016 and 2017 for a politician to say there were good whites marching with tiki torches in Charlottesville, or that a judge who was born in Indiana to Mexican American, to parents who came, who uh, national origin was Mexico, couldn't be fair in hearing a case, or to retweet a fringe racist video from the UK, and for a political party to defend that defend all of that in one form or another. And what that is doing, and again, I, I'm focusing on Trump examples, but what you have is a, is a, the divisions among the politics are not just on like whether tax cuts should go here or tax cuts should go there, or whether, you know, even on some of the div divisive social issues about, you know, whether there should be prayer, you know, prayer in school or crushes on the, on the square during Christmas. But they are going more to um, people's sense of who they are. Um, so it's, you know, I described this to a Republican audience about tech. Like, tech is, the tech companies on the West Coast are largely going so strongly democratic, and you see California as a whole going so democratic, because like, some of these issues, they're just gating issues. Like, you could be in favor of, you know, net neutrality, lower taxes, you know, free internet, whatever. Like, but if you, can't, but if, but if you, if you don't believe that dreamers should stay, and you don't believe that there is such a thing as global warming, and you're not willing to engage, you're not willing to acknowledge that, you know, someone who, um, uh, calls themselves a neo-Nazi and marches with torches is not a good person. Like, there's just no entry point for that for that person to to like consider your candidacy. My and and there's and there's and and the truth is on the and the true and the reverse is also true. I mean, I've seen focus groups, believe me, in places like Wisconsin and and Pennsylvania, where likewise there are there are you know there are particularly non-college educated uh, white voters who just think like. The Democratic Party, they're, they're, they are so culturally different from them. You mean the Hollywood elites? Yeah, the, the Hollywood elites, the Washington elites, the New York elites. Mike, so I, so I, I, think that that, I think that that's like a hard thing. That's a hard thing to ever put. That's a hard, that's a hard divide right. to put back together. So, but, it, but let me ask you, I know we're here to talk about common ground, but I'd be thrown out of the ranks of journalism if I didn't ask you how much responsibility rests with the president as Mark said, for throwing accelerant on this polarization that exists now. Uh, well, I thought he was going to say something admirable about Newt Gingrich. Did I miss that part? <laughs> oh, the admirable thing about Newt Gingrich is, is it's a I'm very. I'm sorry. I just want to go back. No, no, to, it was a very. As a, as a non as a non journalist deflection. who's going to ask, who's it's going a, to it was a, a very. Here. No, no. It, 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 I, you know, Newt Gingrich, first of all, I have my career because of Newt Gingrich. So, like, if... That's his admirable if, thing. <laughs> Newt Gingrich understood, the, as a tactician, the power of this approach. Yeah. And as a political person, like, that, that was revolutionary. Like, he deserves, as a... For everyone who is a political operative, like your son, going from state to state to state, like, in some ways, Newt Gingrich invented the tactics of modern politics in that respect. I mean, Newt Gingrich was the, was the individual when they did not allow you to pan the galleries of the, uh, of, mm -hmm. of the House of Representatives would stand there and give these 20 minute floor speeches that if you're watching on C-SPAN, you thought it was a packed you house. Was, <laughs> there was nobody, nobody there. there. Yeah. And that's how he, he, he came from the back bench to, to rise already to the speaker. So I filibustered enough, I'll get back to your question, which, uh, how much does it, I, I think we've been trending, um, I think we've been trending this way for, for, for a while. Um, I, I think there was a, a clear distinction in 2016 um, that if you, if you loved uh, the way uh, Washington operated and you thought that Washington was doing a good job, you were gonna vote for Hillary Clinton. And if you didn't think Washington was doing a good job, and we've been railing against Washington, both parties, for 20, 30, 40 years now, 
uh, wasn't doing a good job and you were finally fed up with it, uh, and you might not be uh, particularly like uh, Donald Trump, but you, you were fed up with it enough, uh, you were going to vote for Donald Trump. And a lot of people did that. And I think the president, uh, with, his, with his tweets and um, with some of the other statements that he's, that he's made, in his mind, he does feel like when he's talking about this, uh, as, you, as you put it in Charlottesville, um, you know, there are good people on both sides. I think he feels in, him, in, in, uh, in, in himself making those statements that he is saying, look, there are, there's evil on both sides and there's good on both sides. Some people are just sick and tired of whatever that other thing might be, whether it's quotas, whether it's um, political correctness or whatnot. So he, he legitimately believes uh, that he is speaking uh, for that kind of silent uh, majority that's out there that the term Nixon used to use uh, when, he's, when he's making these statements. So it doesn't necessarily come from a calculated um, place of malice. It comes from the way that he uh, has used technology, he has used the media, uh, and he has used his ability as, um, as someone who's been kind of at the, uh, a public figure for all of these years. Uh, it's the way that he that he connects. So my but has he also used his words and his tweets to to expose some of the uglier parts of our country to cause more divide? Well, it depends on your perspective on that. In, in all seriousness, and I don't mean to be flippant about this, but from from your perspective, um, how many of those tweets did you read on Twitter? Any of them? I feel like no, you, you actually go on Twitter I and did. read it from the yes. president's tweets. Right now, You're a minority. Really? The, the vast majority of the people in this room hear about the president's tweets not by reading his Twitter feed, but by the mainstream media publicizing those Twitter yeah. feeds. So yeah. Jackie, I guess I would throw this back onto you, because this is, this is something I've been discussing uh, uh, for a while. I, I, I've been doing this, this fellowship at Georgetown University with, with college students. And we talk about this. Why, why, have you, why has uh, the president's tweets taken on such a um, life of their own? Because he's the president of the United States. He is the president of the United States. He's speaking. It's the way he chooses to communicate. No, no. I understand that. Wait, but let it's me... the way he chooses to communicate. No, no. I don't think that he has had an interview since the NBC interview back in March <coughs> or April. It is how he chooses <coughs> to communicate. He, I mean, wouldn't we be? He does more. He does more gaggles with the press uh, on the way to Marine One than any president has before. He chooses to communicate in different ways that aren't set pieces, and that might upset some journalists. It may give other journalists who don't have the gravitas to get those set pieces some heartache. But he chooses to uh, communicate with the media in a much uh, broader uh, sense. I can't remember the last pool that was brought into the Oval Office in the Obama administration where Obama said, boo. He didn't say a word to those pool reporters. They got their pictures and they got out. The president actually interacts with those pool reporters. So he treats the media in a different fashion than Obama did, than W did, than uh, Clinton did. And the, but let me get to this, to this minor point and then we can move on to the, other, to the other parts of this. We've got a mainstream media that focuses on these tweets and granted he is the president so he understands the power of these tweets who focus on these tweets and then blows them up into, a, uh, in, into the next segment of their, what I, I've been calling the 24-minute news cycle. He yeah. blows it up into the next segment uh, before they go to commercial break. Yeah. And yeah. It, it was great as a communications director. Yeah. I didn't put out uh, really, when you're a communications director, the way you used to communicate our press releases. Mm -hmm. When you wanted to put something out uh, from the White House, you put out a press release, They'd cover that press release, um, maybe, and that was the traditional way to do it. Yep. When I was there, I would, I would write three tweets. I'd give them to the president. I'd call them hot, medium, and mild. And the president <laughs> would, would read through them and uh, generally pick one. The and hot one? I'll leave that for you to decide. <laughs> would pick one, and that, would go, and that would go out during the day. And that got so much more coverage than yeah. me going the traditional route of putting out a press release. So for me, I actually found his use of Twitter 
uh, to be a tool that we were just learning to use because the cable news networks and others really didn't know how to handle it yet. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to get to a point where we get, we un, folks are, his use of Twitter is not going to be as salacious uh, probably a year from now as it is now, but we're getting, we're, we're going through a learning curve. What makes curve. you say that? Because I think the mainstream media is going to learn uh, what to cover uh, and when to cover it. Um, and that and his, not be so right. reactionary. And, and I think, but here's the flip side of that though, because the president does like to have coverage, some of his tweets might even get farther uh, to the fringe in order to attract that attention. So, so, so we're in this period of feeling each other out. So can I just take a little bit of the sort of gloss Remember, off we're of common ground right, here. We're trying right. to... A little bit of the gloss <laughs> off of this. Not that Last I'm in the middle week, for... Last week, he retweeted out a fascist. A fascist. Not a... Like a fascist from Britain who is actually banned. Their political party is banned in Britain. Um, and retweeted a racist video that was false and was condemned by our strongest and most important ally in the world, Great Britain, across their ideological spectrum, from the right to the left. This, there is, if you look at my Twitter, my Twitter account. There is no one who is more who is more negative or consistently negative on the on the mainstream media than I am. So believe me, like, you know, Dean McKay should resign. Like, the New York Times should hang its head in shame. And I await the correction when they wrote the story that said the FBI sees no connection between the Trump campaign and Russia. So one day we'll see that correction. Um, so I'm not here to defend the mainstream media, but. The idea that somehow the President of the United States gets to tweet out racist videos and create a spat between Great Britain and the United States over it, and the problem is the media is covering it, is just not right. I mean, that, is, that isn't what's news. No. It's newsworthy that the President of the United States, first of all, is following racist. I mean, like, my thing is, like, how the hell does the President even find these people? Like, how does he know? Why is he following some neo Nazi? or some neo-fascist in Britain to even know to retweet this stuff. Mike, take a moment to respond to that, but then I want to move back, back and, to common and move on with the conversation. <laughs> uh, I guess what I'd uh, respond to that is uh, the, the, um, if we're just going to focus on one tweet or a set of three retweets of three videos, we can, we can have an argument as, as um, communications director, would I have wanted the president to tweet those out uh, while we're in the midst of the final negotiations of, of tax reform? Absolutely not. Um, I think they took us uh, down a pathway that was not helpful for getting tax reform done. A more cynical person might say, well, you know, the, the news media spent all day talking about those three tweets rather than the messy negotiations that were going on in the Senate giving them uh, a breather so that they could actually get something done without the media hanging over, their, uh, hanging over them during that period of time. A more cynical person would say, well, that's why he did it. Got it. I, I'm not making that argument. Um, I, I do believe uh, that uh, he felt that those videos were real at the time. There was an issue that, that he wanted to expose, and he put those, he put those out. And then we, we find out after the fact all of the, the details which you've put up. I don't think he knew all of those details when he was retweeting that. And that the, doesn't make the, it right or wrong, right. But, I'm, but I'm saying, and, and also, you know, um, so there, there are probably, oh, I, I mean, there's at least a dozen, if not two dozen tweets that come out a day um, from, the, from, from the White House. So we can talk about and cherry pick through that, but I could make an argument as to why that was, a, from a strategic standpoint, it was probably helpful to tax reform, but I'm not going to do that today. Let's step back from, from the 24-hour news cycle, although a cycle to me 24 always- 24 minute. Say, yeah, 24 yeah, minute. Right. But here's what I would say about using the word cycle. It suggests there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. I think in the world in which we're living, there is no beginning, middle, and end. It just keeps going on. Mm -hmm. But what I want to ask is this. Do you both see this moment we're living in now as a kind of ebb and flow to the politics of America? 
or are we living in a transformational moment that will be felt 20 years from now? Uh, I think we're living in a transformational moment from the perspective of we are, we, we are transitioning from the way that news was uh, captured and transmitted uh, maybe 10 years ago, before the advent, the real advent of social media, the real advent of uh, newspapers and cable news networks and broadcast networks uh, losing their ability to fund correspondence and local newspapers, losing their ability to fund uh, uh, reporters in the way that they used to through the use of classified news. You know, Craigslist killed the newspaper in my, in my mm -hmm. mind because it took away all of the revenue that they had to pay for all of the yeah. reporting that they did. And now we have this wonderful, I, you know, as a, as a Republican, I think competition is fantastic. And we have this wide world of <clears throat> news uh, 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 to choose from. But what we're finding ourselves doing in this, in this plethora of choice is segmenting, self-segmenting ourselves. Uh, when I went to the Burke Library as a student uh, in the class of 92, I had to use the card catalog. <laughs> Right, and I would stumble across books that I or other research materials when I was in the card catalog at the Burke Library that I kind of felt that, you know that's interesting too. So I might pull one of those out. I'd stumble across things. Now, when you can Google something or when you do your research and it's so narrow cast, you don't have that op opportunity to stumble across other pieces of information. And I think in the news world, we are we are absolutely doing that to ourselves now. So that not only are, am I only getting news from people that I agree with or think I agree with, but I'm excluding all of the other opportunities I might have to stumble across a different opinion. And when I do stumble across a different opinion and I look at their narrow casting, half the time they're denigrating the other side because that's how they keep their people in their narrow cast excited and, 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 and tuned in. Because at the end of the day, all of these establishments, whether they be social media outlets or digital media outlets or cable news or newspapers, they're all for-profit corporations. They all are trying to attract an audience. They're all doing everything they can to maximize their bottom line and make sure that they exist in the next year. And so they're going to do everything they can to keep their niche audience happy and keep them engaged. But in terms of politics, mm -hmm. transformational or ebb and flow? No, I, I think we're, we're transformational in the sense that we're going to come out of this five years from now, maybe ten years from now, in a very different place on how we consume news and how we consume politics and how we discuss politics than we are today. Mark? Yeah, I actually agree with almost everything Mike said. Common I, I think, ground. Oh, we're done. Yeah, so I Mike drop. <laughs> well, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it is probably a sign of the... Uh, of the state of your former colleagues uh, in the news media, in the, in the mainstream media, that the two of us have common ground um, on this. I, I, I am, most people consume news. In fact, not even most, like the overwhelming number of people consume news um, through Facebook, through Twitter, through listservs, through people it, it is not just that they are self-selecting news outlets. They're actually self, they're actually disaggregating or aggregating, depending on the way you look at it, particular articles from particular sources. So, so the truth is that like people don't, what, what, what Apple did to record albums, <laughs> right, by selling individual songs is now what's happened to the newspaper. So like, honestly, and some of you are going to, just looking at the demographics of the room, some of you are going to be like, no, 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 this isn't true. Almost no one reads the New York Times. They read articles in the New York Times, but they don't read the New York Times. When I grew up, like you would have the New York Times and you would start on page one, and then you would go to page two. Then you'd go to page three, then you'd go to page four, you'd kind of like work your way through the New York Times. Now, if there is an article that someone on the left of center likes that happens to be in the New York Times, it self-populates in their Facebook feed. Well, not my feed, but. No, no, on the left. <laughs> I said it, self-populates. I know. 
or in their Twitter feed, or their friends share it, or they Snapchat about it. Like it's, it's, and then on the right, if there's a New York Times article that someone on the right likes, even though they may otherwise hate the New York Times, right. that one article will populate in their Facebook. They finally feed got it their, right. Right, finally got it right. Right. So, so it's so I agree, I completely agree that it's it's um, uh, that. It's transformational in that not only aren't you stumbling across other books, you're not even stumbling across other chapters in the right. same book. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like you're 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 like getting going to the card catalog and they're saying go to page 53, and then you don't actually get copies of page 52 or 54. Right. Do you know what I mean? So you're not stumbling even through right. the whole the whole range of articles. You know, if I if I see a once in a blue moon, there's a Daily Caller story, and I'm like, huh, they must have had like, they must have mixed things up. And like, it'll, I'll be like, I actually agree with the Daily Caller for, but like, I'm only seeing that one story, and I'm not seeing like there are four other stories on the same right. topic before, or the other stories in their, in their coverage that day. It's just that one little narrow piece. Well, I, I, well, I think Jackie's uncomfortable that we're going after the news media. Oh, okay. <laughs> so maybe we should switch Not at all. Topic here. Not at all. I just, to be perfectly honest, find it interesting that a question that I was asking about our political life, our political dialogue, our political ideals, you've both chosen to focus on the media. That's our common ground. And not, oh, that's our common ground. And not the politics. I, we're, we're a theme-driven uh, I, Duo did here. you think I wouldn't notice you didn't answer my <laughs> question? I had a lot of coffee this morning. <laughs> so let me try again. Um, as I was preparing for the panel, I came across a, a fabulous graphic that was in the Washington Post um, a couple of years ago. And it was uh, clouds populated with small red and blue dots going back to the 1960s. And in the 1960s, there were sprinkles of blue in the red cloud and sprinkles of red and vice versa. And over the years, the clouds began getting single color. And then the clouds, in more recent years, began separating like that instead of being like that. And they're right here now. Blue, red. Yep, somebody says in the audience. So how do we bring it back to the clouds at least touching each other. Well, let me, let, me, let me not challenge that because I think when we started and when you asked your first question, I think we- It was in the Washington we, Post, it had to be true. I think, <laughs> I think, I think we addressed this at the, at, the, at the beginning when you asked, you know, where, how did we get here? And we are there and I don't think either- uh, But Mark now I'm or, asking how do we get back? I, I under, I, and I'm going to, Challenge that premise with this. Okay. If I am a political professional and I can, what is, what is my end goal? My end goal is to win elections. If I can win elections, how do I want to win those elections? And you may all think I'm cynical for saying this. I want to win them the most efficient way possible. And this is what I started talking about uh, that where our politics were when you talk about districts, especially if we talk about the House of Representatives, we have these gerrymandered districts in which you know a Republican is going to represent that district. Which Republican is going to represent that district? Well, whoever wins the primary. How are you going to win the primary? By self-selecting, most likely, in a Republican district, the most conservative person challenging to win that primary because the general election doesn't matter anymore because we've gerrymandered ourselves a Republican district. I would dare say on the left, it's the same thing with Democrat districts. You're going to have the most liberal member uh, win that. We don't have blue dogs anymore, really. We don't have moderate Tuesday group Republicans anymore, mm -hmm. really. So we've created in the House of Representatives through redistricting these segmented clouds, as you put it, but they're districts. And so when you run as a political professional, you run a campaign, you run a campaign and you advise your client while they're governing how to maintain their elected office and which issues they should be talking about, which issues they should avoid and how they should be voting and how they should be talking about those votes in order to keep them uh, in, that, in that cloud because they're gonna win that district and you use technology to do it and you use, um, 
and 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 that's your focus uh, as you yeah. go along. So a lot, we're playing a game that was already preset as you watched uh, as you watched the districts morph over the years. I would lay a gerrymandering map every 10 years when we do this, and the use of data and the ability to do that against your Washington Post cloud, mm -hmm. and I think you'd see a mirror of the two <laughs> things. So I really, I'm really grateful for your candor. I think it's fantastic. Because we're and, off the record, right? And That camera's not on. And, and, and yet what I hear you saying is, as long as we win an election, there is no there's no reason to search for common ground. Well, let me ask you this question. How many people here think that the moral, uh, that the, the moral player in this uh, theater of politics that we are is the campaign professional? <laughs> Anybody? No. I mean, I, I, you can say everything that you want to say, but people are hired and fired in this business to do yeah. one thing, and that's to win. It's like a head coach of a football team. You could, be, you could have the, you know, the greatest bunch of folks on your team, and they lose year after I'm a Bills fan, so I can say these things. <laughs> they lose year after year after year after year <laughs> after year, and you, you get a new head coach. Yeah. You get new players. Yeah. That's the way that that's yeah. the, the way that this this works. So if we're looking to politics to solve, you know, this um, and political consultants to solve this, I think you're looking in the wrong place. Mark. So before everyone lets the voters off the hook, you all. Yeah. Right. Before you let yourselves off, um, when I started doing this, a competitive house, and, and this is not to say gerrymandering is not gerrymandering is a significant piece of this. There is absolutely no question about it, and the ability to gerrymander with technology, one of the things people say that's just wrong is people are like, oh, politicians have always gerrymandered. It used to be gerrymandering was you sat down and you were like, oh, you know, Utica is pretty Republican, but Rome is a little more democratic. Now we sit down and we say, okay, at the block level, like Mohawks, we want to move, yeah. we want to move these houses here and these houses there, right? So there's no question, gerrymandering technology is a piece of it is an important piece. When I started doing this, a competitive House district was 55-45. If you had a House district where it was 54% Democratic and 46% Republican, the Democrat could lose, okay? Last year, do you know how many House members lost in 54% districts? Zero. About 55%, zero. 54, zero. 53, zero. 52? Zero. Okay, we just, like, the fact is, we even, what, what constitutes a safe seat now can actually be pretty narrow um, because there aren't that many of you out there who actually are contemplating voting for the person of the other party. Hmm. You say you are. You, you tell pollsters you are. You tell your friends you are. You explain that, you know, in 1984 you voted for Ronald Reagan and therefore you're really kind of like a swing voter. Right. You voted for Obama twice. You voted for Clinton. Right, right. exactly. Like, or, or you, you know, you say, oh, you know, I always liked Mario Cuomo, so I'm, you know, kind of a swing voter. I liked Ed Koch. Like, Ed Koch was mayor 40 years ago. Or, you know, my favorite I get from Republicans is, you know, I really like John Kennedy. I'm like John Kennedy. <laughs> right. I mean, so, so part of it is that. If you look at the polling of, just take the economy, okay, and you ask Democrats and Republicans, or this was in the Washington Post, I think, like, how do you think the economy is doing? And Obama in office, Democrats thought it was doing well, Republicans thought it was doing badly. Trump takes office, and like, literally, it's the same economy. It's like a month later, it was in February. I mean, yeah. the guy had been in office yep. for a week, and now it's completely the reverse. Democrats yeah. now think the economy is in the right. wrong place, and Republicans now think you it's in the right You cheer for your place. team. It's become very much, and, and lest I be accused of plagiarism on the little camera, I don't remember which politician said it, it is no longer about the name on the back of the jersey, it's just the color on the front. Right. And that's not a problem of, that is a problem that people who are political operatives have contributed to, for sure, and technology and campaign finance, and all of that has changed, for sure. But that is also something about the voters. Like, voters are 
are turning off the information that they are hearing. I promise you in Alabama, if the news had come out that Doug Jones had the Democratic candidate had, had, uh, had been accused of having uh, uh, sexual relations or, or attempted sexual relations with six, 14, 15, and 16 year olds, the, the reaction among Republican politicians in Alabama and Republican voters in Alabama would be quite different. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's of course. well, but you say of course, but that's, but that's the point. Like, that's not redistricting. That's not like who the candidates are. The of course in that is that that's just like, it's the, it's the I, there was a bill that was in Congress uh, called the Disclose Act, which would have required the disclosure of, of where money comes from to, for super PACs and other dark money and dark money organizations. And it was a time when Democrats had 59 votes in the Senate. They needed 60 to invoke cloture. And I was in a meeting with a moderate Republican I was with the Democrats, but in a meeting with a moderate Republican senator who would have benefited politically, you would, electorally, for having, disclose, having the Disclosed Act. It would have benefited their election. They were in the cycle. And they, and they had previously talked about the importance of transparency in politics. And uh, they said in a candid moment to the then Democratic leader in my presence, Mitch told us this is one where we're playing shirts and skins, so I can't be with you. Now, for those of you who remember, shirts and skins is like from the, high, the, the elementary school playground, right? Mm -hmm. And like what he was just saying is McConnell has said this is, a part, this is just a like your, it's a DR divide, and that's where right. we are. And that's where, that's so, not just where the operatives are. I, I, I do, no, I do appreciate that I took the blame for most of this, yeah. and, and Mark blamed all of you. <laughs> yeah, that's just, right. just to be clear. And, 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 no, that, that, and here's the you're building right. on that. Yeah. I want to ask you one last question before we open it up to all of you, because I suspect there's a question or no. two out there. And just take a moment to answer this, and they'll get the mics going out there. What is the moral responsibility of Democrats and Republican leaders today to heal the divides in our country. What is it? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at that first. Um, and this is not gonna surprise anyone, uh, I don't think. Um, you, I've thought a lot about this, both in preparation for today, but also when I saw the announcement of the Common Ground Project. Um, I don't want to make common ground on the question of neo-Nazism. I just don't. And I, by the way, I mean that both with respect to Donald Trump and Dean Bacay. So the, Dean Bacay is the publisher of the New York Times whose newspaper just ran a story talking about how normal neo-Nazis are. Um, they have regular tattoos and jobs and you know, ordinary concerns. Like, I'm not interested in a common ground where we say there are good people who march at night with tiki torches at the University of, uh, at, uh, University of Virginia. I'm just not, I'm just like not interested in that common ground. I'm not interested in common ground over the question of whether or not um, uh, 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 we ought to demonize an entire religion. I'm just, I'm, so, so here's your problem, is common ground in and of itself is not a goal, at least not for me. And I don't think there's moral response. I think actually the moral responsibility that I feel is to not find common ground. The moral responsibility I feel is to stand up for it. Because honestly, my family and many of your families, um, they were murdered in Europe because good people wanted to make common ground with really bad people. So don't tell me that my moral responsibility is to figure out how to split the difference um, or find a way to have an open communication with people who want to say that, who want to demonize a race, a religion, a people, um, uh, because I just don't see that as my, I don't see that as the moral obligation. My moral obligation is to speak loudly and I think it is the moral obligation of everyone in this room 
as uncomfortable as it is in your daily lives and the, and the price you will pay in your daily lives on whatever, you, whatever the issues are, whether they're on the left or on the right, you know, to stand up and not try to find common ground where, where, where there is a moral imperative not to do so. Mike? Well, I'm not sure where I can add anything to what you just said, Mark. <laughs> but if I focus on infrastructure rather than neo-Nazism, mm -hmm. um, I think there may be a space for common ground. I agree. Yes, and if I, I wish the president if, started if with I an infrastructure bill. If I focus on health care, I think there might be a space for common ground. If I focus on tax reform, I think there might be a space for common ground. And to, to um, just my little, my little answer to your, to your bigger question, um, I think it was wrong for the Democrats to pass Obamacare without a single vote, uh, Republican vote. I think it was wrong for Republicans to try to uh, repeal and replace Obamacare without a single Democratic vote. I think it's wrong and uh, detrimental to the long-term lasting effects of tax reform for the Republicans to vote for tax reform without a single Democratic vote. So I think there should be common ground on these issues that are not genocide and neo-Nazism and other issues that I am in full agreement with what you just said. Um, but I think we have a problem in Congress, especially when you are not reaching across the aisle and you can't find one of those other individuals uh, to participate with, because my guess is Chuck and Nancy have called a shirts and skins game for tax reform. And they're not letting Manchin or High Camp or anybody else off the hook to vote and, and to promote um, uh, and negotiate with Mitch McConnell and the Republicans for things that they would benefit from in tax reform. So we've got, we've got this kind, and it's, it's on the right and the left. Yeah. And, 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 and so I, I just wanted to get Chuck and Nancy uh, in there. So one question, which is, which is a knock on Democrats I'm about to make, or a, 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 is, the solu is part of the solution in the Senate, and the reason why I say it's knock on Democrats is because Republicans point out it started under, well, sorry before Reed, but, but it continued. Yeah. Is, is, it, is it pushing back to the 60 vote requirement? I actually, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, going to go old school yeah. and, and say yes. Yeah. I think, and, and actually, I'd go even old, old school and say, put your money, put your feet, put your bladder where your mouth is, and, and actually stand, have a standing, real, standing have, a, have a standing filibuster. Yeah. This 60 vote cloture thing, yeah. I think, is a cheap version of Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Yeah. And, and on that, a question from the yeah. audience, please. Uh, there are folks with mics wandering around. Uh, there's a gentleman in the middle there with his hand up. It is a mother's prerogative to call on her son first. <laughs> yeah, full disclosure, she's my mom. Um, I'm Phil, I'm class of 14 from Hamilton. Um, I work in electoral politics too. Uh, something I've noticed, and this is anecdotal, and just what I've seen in polling, is it seems like Republicans are better at holding their nose and going to the ballot box for their person Maybe not because they like them, but they're better than the alternative. And I think Democrats are really bad at that because they want their first choice. And if they don't get their first choice, they whine and they go home and they don't turn out. I think that happened in places like Milwaukee in Wisconsin in 16. You saw a 40,000 vote drop off, um, things like that. So I'm just wondering, and it's the opposite of what this is about, but how do, how do you think you get people to understand that um, the alternative to not voting is worse than voting for someone that you don't necessarily fully agree with or like. Well, let me just, I, I think if you want somebody to vote for you, you should actually go and ask for their votes, and it would have been nice for Hillary to have gone to Wisconsin. I mean, let's, let, let's just use your example as, as a, uh, you've got to ask somebody for your vote. It's, it's politics 101. And she ignored, uh, she ignored that group. She ignored uh, several uh, groups in Pennsylvania that probably would have swung the, in Michigan, that would have swung the election uh, her way. We really, look, the rules of the game were you had to get the most electoral votes. And you had to build that state by state by state. So when individuals say to me, uh, you know, oh, uh, uh, Hillary got uh, 2 million, 3 million more votes than 
Trump, I say, big deal. I'm going to use the, the Bills as an example here. I can't tell you how many games that they gained more offensive yards than the other team, and they still lost the game because they didn't score as many points. Because scoring more points is the rules of the game. So um, it doesn't matter if you don't ask for the vote. And I, I, I don't necessarily see it the same way you do. I think Democrats are as good with holding their nose and voting for their candidate as, as you say Republicans are. Yeah, I, I would, I would um, uh, respond to Mike with a couple of things. First is, I think I agree with you. I'm a big, I knew I'd be a election lawyer when I had a, my son, and my wife said, you should play board games with your son. So I said, fine, I'll play shoots and ladders. And the first thing I did was like read the instructions, because I figured, I'm going to beat this four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> we are exactly the same. Right, exactly. <laughs> so so on, on the ground. The, so, so That's your, right. Your point about popular vote versus electoral college, I, I agree with. Like the rules are, you run elections, you know what the rules are. Uh, and the fact that you got three million more votes doesn't change the outcome right. of the election. Now, here's what I find interesting, though, and it's, it's why I gave the little speech I gave a few minutes ago. I agree with Mike. And had the President of the United States given that answer, we might be in a different place as a country. But what was the answer he gave? It was illegal immigrants. They poured over the, the border, and they voted illegally. He actually did win. He, he won three million more, he won more votes, but there were three million Mexicans who came across the border, which is why we need a wall. Okay, guys, so like this is why I think, you know, a lot of people on the left feel the way they do about this because it's a, a discourse that is, well, these are the rules, this is the Electoral College, it's in the Constitution. She should have gone to, uh, uh, Milwaukee, oh, okay. you know, whatever. Like, totally get that. That's a, that's, there are no dog whistles going on there. Okay, that's just like good common sense electoral. Right. But when your answer is not that, and your answer is the black president probably was born in Kenya, and illegals are pouring over the border, and that's why the vote totals were the way they were. Right, that's a different argument. And for those of you out there who, who still support President Trump, you own that. Okay, I'm just telling you. You can shake your heads no. You own it. And if throwing kids off health insurance and getting your tax cuts are worth it, that's fine. But you own it. You own every bit of that. I'm glad you're running with this theme. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Uh, first, I'd just like to say it's been so long since I've sat in a discussion that has both points of view in one room and actually is discussing. It's really a good feeling. And I think this program is a terrific program. So thanks, everybody, for, uh, for, for putting this together. Uh, and good job, Hamilton. Um, I wanted to go back to the point you guys were making about gerrymandering and, and you know, skins versus shirts. What do we do about that? I mean, if, if, if we agree that that, accepting all you're saying about the rules of the game, et cetera, that doesn't get to a very good discussion of issues, and which means the issues just fester, and you know, that, that doesn't end well, generally, if you look at political history, right? So what do we do about that? And what do you, if, if technology is part of the, the, the formulation of the problem, because people were able to do that very precise analysis, is technology part of the solution, potentially, in breaking down some of those barriers? If we move to different forms of voting, electronic voting, et cetera, is that, is that on the horizon at all, or is that visible? So I think on the technology, on gerrymandering specifically, I do a lot of uh, redistricting litigation and have argued several cases in the Supreme Court on gerrymandering. The, the complicated thing about redistricting is that the pen has to start somewhere. Right? So you start, with a, you start with the state of New York. Yeah. And like you've got to start somewhere. Like the, you've got to put that pen down someplace. And what you hear a lot is, well, can't we just make perfect uh, squares? And then the first thing I always say to them is, you don't mean squares, you mean circles. And they, know, they say, no, no, we mean squares. They're like, no, 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 you actually mean circles. No, no, squares. I'm like, no, 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 because if you wanted a perfectly compact district, it wouldn't be a square, it'd be a circle. 
fine. The problem is people don't live in squares. Or right? circles. People, or circles. People, like, there are more people in Manhattan than there are in Buffalo. And so you need one person, one vote, right? So you need equal population. And sometimes county lines are more important than, than, um, than uh, compactness is. Sometimes you'll have a population like the African American population in Alabama where you have a black belt. So it's, it's, a, it's not a, it's a, it's a historic population, but it doesn't meet a, a, a right. and so the problem is you've gotta, you, you immediately get confronted with a series of choices. Um, I unsuccessfully argued the Democratic position in redistricting in New York, a, sort of a bitter moment for me since we controlled everything and probably could have gerrymandered it into oblivion, but <laughs> nevertheless. Um, uh, I, and one of the things I was arguing had to do with Long Island. I'm actually, I grew up in Nassau County in Valley Stream. Um, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, there was this like debate about like, how do we draw the districts on Long Island? Do we draw them east, west, or north, south? And so, like, on the one hand, it was like, you should draw them north-south, you know, because the South Shore and the North Shore, and that's how people on Long Island oftentimes think about themselves. On the other hand, you could draw them east-west because media markets and newspapers and sort of traffic patterns and, and, uh, and also county, county lines, right? So, so the problem with gerrymandering is there's no, people always want to know, like, is there just like a computer we can put this all into? There are just like a lot of inputs that go into it. So there are efforts to try to curb partisan gerrymandering through various, there's a case actually in the Supreme Court right now involving partisan gerrymandering that embraces something called the efficiency gap where you look and see how many wasted votes of the other party are there in districts. And that's like one way to think about competitiveness. But it's, I'm not sure, there, there isn't an easy solution. There are lots of different experiments. California's got a nonpartisan citizen commission. Iowa has a nonpartisan um, professional, essentially, commission. There are states where the courts get involved in drawing the maps. Um, but it's, it's but, it, but here's the thing. Here's the exciting thing, and maybe the detrimental thing, is it starts at the state level. Totally. So you do have these laboratories of democracy yes. called the states where you know, citizens can rise up in one state and show a way to go in terms of how to re redistrict. And I'm, as, since I don't do this for a living uh, in terms of the, the legal side of it, but there have been several states, I believe, that are trying to just, they, they, they say it's all counties. Yeah. That you've got to go. Right. You just, you know, that's what we're going to do. We've got, these, uh, we've got these traditional historic lines. Mm -hmm. Your district is going to be made up of these counties, so you get to 800,000 people or whatever an average yep. house district is, and then we move to the next one. And some are going to have 820, some are going to have 780 in terms of the number of people that are in them, but that's how we're going to do it, and that's a more fair way to do it. Uh, we'll see if that works. Um, but you're right. It's very much state by state. So, like, I, I've said this to folks uh, this, this issue of, of, of uh, municipal and, and governmental lines, county lines and the like. In some places, there's a lot of sense to that. Like, typically in the South, you know, when I went to Duke Law School, like, Durham is a county, Wake is a county. People, people organize their governmental affairs through county lines. I spend a lot of time in Vermont. Nobody thinks of the world there in counties. They think of them in terms of towns because they all have town meetings. Right. And so it's it's right. so. But thank it, God they only have one rep. But the but the point right. But, you know, point, but, but your point is that it is yeah, very yeah, much yeah. state. It yes. is a laboratory yeah. of democracy because there are different. Right. There are different places where different things mean. Right. And there may be fifty different solutions to this. Right. But I, I I don't know if if you're saying this. But I guess for my my answer to you would be that that's where we need to start. You need to start on the state level. This is not a yeah, national discussion because of the way our government is, mm -hmm. is set up. But we have a lot of questions in the audience, so let's try to get through a bunch of them right now. This gentleman right here. I came this morning uh, with a question in mind whether Trump is a phenomenon or whether he is the the result of long-term trends. And I think I've heard you say it's the latter. Uh, the, 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 uh, and correct me if, if mm -hmm. you disagree with that. Now, my question is, um, 
What is happening in the context of Republicans and the anyone but Trump mentality? Is that growing? Uh, is that being given up? And what does that say about the future? Well, I'll, I'll, um, I, I started thinking about the, the uh, trend or, or phenomenon. I would say I, I do think the, the, the President Trump is a phenomenon in the sense that he spent far less money mm -hmm. uh, to be elected president than, the, than Hillary Clinton did. Uh, he ran a very, very, very unconven unconventional campaign from the perspective of, a, of how presidential campaigns are, are normally run. Um, and he gave every celebrity out there a hope and dream that they too <laughs> could be president of the United States. Kid, rock, kid. So, exactly. So, um, he's going to be a senator first and then we'll move to president. But the, uh, but the, uh, so I think he's a phenomenon in that sense. I don't see that easily replicating itself. Um, there were several factors that, that went into him being elected in, 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 um, in 2016. Um, that you probably won't have, you, you know, presidential election to presidential election. But I think you're going to see a lot more celebrities trying, a lot more individuals that make a name for themselves in something else and then try to jump, you know, jump it to the highest level, the highest rung of the political ladder. Um, so he's a phenomenon in that sense. Um, and your second part of your question, because I just filibustered what, never myself. Trump, never Trumpers. Oh, in the Republican Party, they're still there. Um, they're, they're just not as... Um, I just don't think they're as vocal um, right now, but there's definitely, there's definitely a divide within the re Republican Party. And I would flip it and say there's also, as, as I am, am, am an observer of, of the Democrats, there's also a, a divide between uh, the, the Bernie supporters and the Hillary supporters within, within that party. I think we have two political parties right now that are really struggling with their identities. Right. Right. Um, so I would, I, would, yeah. I would broaden your question and say I think we've got it from both sides. And I would say very, very quick, just really quickly, I think the, the trend, if there is a trend, here is, the, here is the question, is the next Republican nominee, not Trump in 16, maybe Trump in 20, we'll see what happens there, is the next Republican nominee going to be um, a white nationalist? Not saying white supremacist. I'm not saying I'm not being overly provocative, but I think it's fair to say that Breitbart, Steve Bannonism, you know, is white nationalism, and is is the next is the Republican part. I think the Republican Party is in the main uncomfortable with that, at least in my perspective. Mm -hmm. But but it's not clear that the base is uncomfortable. It, it's, actually, it's clear the base is very comfortable with it. A the question answer, on this side. No? Okay. Then up here. Can you just wait for the mic to come so our online audience can hear you? So getting back to the shirts and skins issue, because I think that's really essential. I know, right? <laughs> um, is this a generational issue? In other words, is the hope that behind the baby boomers, uh, there's a generation or several generations, and I hate to describe them as this, that, you know, while they played shirts and skins at the end, they all got a trophy. They all sat down and shared juice boxes and cookies, and that they can actually play better in the sandbox, and that it's our generation who really screwed this up. So let me just say one thing, and then I'm going to let Mike answer. So I'm a Gen Xer, and the only people more annoying than the boomers, who I thought were the most self-centered, entitled hey, people hey, in the hey, world, hey, hey, hey. Watch are the what millennials. You, say here. <laughs> you are absolutely <laughs> correct on that. So I just feel like I'm we're getting out. out. We're so important. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Go Thanks ahead. for that. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you're right. Look, we, we found common ground. Gen X rules. <laughs> Boomers suck. I mean, it's... it's no, but his point is, do you think it's better? Uh, hey, uh, John, you're in the... Werner, how many, uh, how many selfies do uh, millennials take? <laughs> On average, millennials will take 27,000 selfies of themselves. Um, in a lifetime or in what? A, in, yes. I, I was shocked by that statistic is that, that I heard. Is that a real statistic? Or John, are you lying or is that a real statistic? <laughs> Fake news. <he's> <laughs> <saying>. <laughs> but, 
But the, the point is, I, I, you know what? Maybe uh, that that all of these uh, of giving a trophy to everybody and giving everybody a ribbon and this kumbaya. I, I don't think so. I, I don't know <laughs> that it's really a generational thing. I think it's a. Um, I don't know that that will. I don't have hope. No. <laughs> It is sad. I mean, look, my, my kids, uh, one of which is a junior at, at Hamilton uh, now, my kids are a lot smarter uh, than we were when we were at yes. Hamilton together. Um, and the Georgetown students that I've interacted with are a lot smarter and a lot more engaged. Um, so I think they will do well. They're just not jaded yet. And maybe, you know, if we can keep them from being jaded, maybe we can have that, but it, it's the rules are the rules need to the rules need to be modified Look, because I, the rules make it where I, we are today. I would ask a question of Mike um, because I'm curious in the Republican perspective on this. I mean, from this is not exactly the way you wanted the question to go, but millennials are. I mean, Trumpism is like a generational gift to the Democratic Party because, like. There just aren't millennial Republicans between the Obama, between people who came of age during Obama who are overwhelmingly Democrats and people who are coming of age under Trump who are even more overwhelmingly Democrats. By that, by the way, I don't mean by way of party registration because they're more independents, but if you talk about voting, voting behavior, right. um, I'm just curious, like, what is the Republican sort of perspective on as as these generation as the millennial generation ages, um, do you all view that that will even out as it ha as it did with the boomers and what? Look, I think when we were when we were going to college, I, I, uh, uh, Democrats made the same argument about Ronald Reagan, that that Ronald Reagan uh, was a I mean we. Ronald Reagan gets a lot of praise now, but back in the yeah. back in the '80s, the Democrats were saying we're, we've got we've got this gift. Of Ronald I don't Reagan. remember he's, a lot of people joining me oh, in the I, new caucus in the new caucus no. bandwagon. Though it well, <laughs> no, they didn't I, jump aboard his tank. I mean, right. I thought I thought I thought I that thought Lloyd true. Benson lit it on fire for me, but you know, yeah. for the rest, no, no, no. My, for the rest I guess, of Hamilton, uh, I, I guess. Answer it quickly so we can get to another question. <laughs> <laughs> this is why conservatives I know, hate the media. I mean, my guy answer. <laughs> and a he, yeah, he gets to go, and I get to answer his <laughs> bombshell of a question quickly. Uh, I, I, politics is so cyclical yeah. that I don't think you're gonna you're gonna have that benefit um, uh, very long term. I think it's difficult for the Democrats to get out of their own way right now, so, and they're not taking advantage of all of all of the opportunity that they think that they may have. So. Yeah. I am heartened uh, because I believe the Democrats will stay as dysfunctional as they have been. <laughs> the lady over here, yes. My question has to do with the business of politics. It seems to me that there is a tremendous amount of money that is focused on winning and losing as opposed to really governing our country. And at what point do we have a responsibility to try and pull some of that back and say, you were elected to do something, you know? Sit down, talk to each other, do something. There's no common ground up there. We, I, we love to have common ground up there. Uh, you know, I think you both have interesting points, but it seems to me that the way the money is flowing through the whole thing and this huge business of, you know, I am paying for you to, to make, make me win is, it, as soon as they win, they should go to Congress and, and do something, not try and win their next election. Well, I, you know, the old, the, uh, when, when this topic gets brought up all the time, people say we spend more money on, on advertising dog food than we spend on our politics, um, which, is, which is true. Um, you just don't notice that because when you spend money on politics, it's so concentrated around elections right. that it seems like you're spending that much more on on politics than you are. It is, it is uh, detrimental to governing that you've got senators and congressional representatives going into the cubby holes in the basements of the DNC and the RNC uh, dialing for dollars. It is. But it's also detrimental, I would argue, that you have taken away what used to be uh, the big tent organizations, the DNC, the RNC, uh, and taken away their ability uh, to be the ones that are trying to get that money and then parsing it out to their, their candidates where you can then, you know, try to um, 
take a, a, a conservative Republican from, from Georgia and a more moderate Republican from Maine and tell them both that you've got to, you know, we've all got to play in the sandbox together in order for you to get the money that we've then raised for you. In 2004, and this was the point I was making at the beginning, we really stripped that ability away from the political parties. I don't know if giving that back to them is the answer, but I, I will stand here and say I don't think taking money out of politics is the answer because then all you'll have are rich people and incumbents who win elections because they've got the entrenched, they've got the entrenched um, advantage that regular citizens uh, uh, don't have. So money actually, I would, I would argue, and we could do a whole other common ground on this, money is the great equalizer uh, in politics. Um, I, I, I could sit here for an hour and a half and make that argument. Um, but it's the way that we raise the money and the way um, that we force our politicians to raise the how, money how is that mo I think is, is how taken is away money from the great well, equalizer? Aren't we taking questions from so the me, audience? So let me, let, me, let, me, let me answer that because I actually agree with Mike <laughs> yeah, on I mean, this. with I, Citizens so, United, with so, dark money? Yeah, so this is where I think Mike oh. is, actually, is actually spot on. Um, Thank you. The first is there's actually, a, right. there's actually a very good book, which I read at Hamilton College in... Professor Eismeyer's um, government class, um, uh, written by a political scientist named Gary Jacobson called The Politics of Congressional Elections. And basically, the entire thesis of the book is it doesn't matter what incumbents raise, it only matters what challengers raise. Yeah. That the problem is that if you control, for, if you control for, for everything else, the amount that a challenger raises is the single best predictor of whether the, challenger, whether the incumbent can be beat. Because the other thing is you have incumbents winning at 98 you know, 96, 98% rates. So the equalizer, the great equalizer that he's referring to is that in some ways, incumbents don't need the money as much as challengers, right. so you need a system. The other thing where I agree with Mike, and this gets to your Citizens United and Super PAC um, point, which I also agree with, is that, um, you know, up until McCain-Feingold, the party committees operated as the largest outside spenders other than campaigns in right. elections. And they did put a moderating force on it. There was a there was a limit to how much money politically the Democratic Party would accept from a wealthy Democrat or a Republican would right. accept from a wealthy the Republican Party would accept from wealthy Republicans. There was a sense that it needed to be politically palatable to the broad spectrum of candidates in your party. Um, and that is just not in the Citizens United era with super PACs, that just isn't true. It's much more um, uh, it's much, it's, you know, the Mercers can spend hundreds of millions of dollars, the, you know, the Koch brothers Koch can spend hundreds of millions of dollars. Soros, you, come on, and, and you were Democrat friends, friends too. And you weren't, and you and you enough, weren't, and you weren't seeing that pre-2004. Um, pre yeah. In 2004, when I represented John Kerry's campaign, we raised and spent, including the DNC money, um, about $250 million. Um, the Clinton campaign, including DNC and state party money, spent, um, you know, well over a billion dollars. So that's, that's you yeah. know, and that's, that's a function of a changed campaign finance system that has disincentivized, because the reason why the, the campaigns got out of the public financing system, which is when, the, when George Bush was in the public financing system. Right. Um, was Last one. That, right? Yeah, was that you then started having the Koch brothers. If the Koch brothers are going to bring $900 million to a presidential race and you're a presidential candidate, you damn well can't be in a public financing system that's only going to spend $100 million, right? So, right. so in some ways, Citizens United, which was the opening of this outside flood of money, yeah. and McCain-Feingold, which kind of kept the parties from being the the, right. the beneficiary of that, there's some truth in that. Yeah, no, I'd make the argument you wouldn't have Citizens United if you didn't have McCain-Feingold. Mm. Um, right, there just wouldn't have been a demand for it. Right, there wouldn't have been. So I know that um, both of you would probably say that reporters will never admit mistakes that they have made. That's true. Absolutely so I'm going to true. admit a mistake that I made. When Hamilton College called and asked if I would moderate this, and they said it was from 9.45 to 11.15, I said, an hour and a half. There's just not enough time to talk. I have not enough things to talk about in an hour and a half. We can never go for that long. Well, we have. 
there are still hands up. We're not going to be able to get to them, which I apologize. So I misjudged. Um, and the conversation has been fabulous and full and candid and hard and thought provoking. And I want to thank both of you so very much for, um, for bringing your A game and in moments finding some common ground, but really for agreeing to share the stage at a time when it's difficult for Democrats and Republicans to get together. So I thank it's you. It's never difficult getting together with him. He's one of the good guys. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much.